Patron Juan wrote in and said, I have listened to your podcast for many years now and found them very valuable. I commented in the past how much I enjoyed your Bowen therapy summary. Personally, I think psychology and therapy are tools for self-knowledge and improving one's life. I got to Bowen and your podcast via a long and winding road in an effort to solve some personal and marital issues. One place where Bowen is mentioned many times is in the work of Dr. David Snarch. If you're familiar with him and what he calls the crucible approach, would you comment, please? If not, what is your approach to marital therapy? As an aside, I'm a physician, and this journey has made me that much better in my profession. Thank you. Well, you are so welcome, physician, listener, patron one. Starch is well known for his work with couples regarding intimacy and sex. So Dr. David Snarch is known for intimacy and sex. He, he talks quite freely and non-creepily about sex in couples. And I really like his work. He's a good author, and his guidance is really quite sound, I think. He's been around for a while. But in my world, he's just one among, among thousands that I respect. There are so many authors and so many excellent, wonderful people to read and to listen to. That uh, uh, and, and Snarch is definitely one of them, but, but you know, he's just one among many. Um, so what is my approach? Well, it's impossible to summarize because even if I had all the time in the world, therapy is impossible to describe. It's too, it's too much of a thing that you have to experience. Even if you watched a therapy episode, it's not the same as being one of the participants. And so it's impossible for, for me to describe, but let me just provide some broad strokes. My, my approach to couple therapy really depends on the couple. It depends on what they present. It depends on their personalities. It depends on how long they want to be in therapy. Some people only want to come to therapy for a few weeks, and some people want to come to therapy for the rest of their life. And so there's so many different factors that go into it. But in general, I tend to do the following. I try to help people understand each other. So much of what goes wrong in couples is when they misunder- misunderstand each other. The husband is feeling hurt, and he doesn't really even know he's feeling hurt. And instead of saying, I feel hurt, he starts to feel angry on the inside, and he starts to criticize his wife. And his wife interprets that criticism as, a, as evidence that her husband is an unloving, terrible human being, and her feelings are hurt. And so she distances, and the husband sees that distancing as hurtful and uh, more evidence that his wife is a cold-hearted bitch. And this happens over and over and over again. And before long, you hate each other and you've fallen out of love and you get divorced. Well, what I try to do is try to slow it all down and try to help people really understand each other. When the husband felt hurt and then later angry and then later critical, where did that begin? Maybe the wife said something small that hurt his feelings. And if he said that, hey, you know what you just said, it hurt my feelings. I know you didn't mean it in a bad way, but when you said that, it sort of hurt my feelings. And then, and the wife says, oh, I didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry. You know, thanks for telling me. Well, that will end that, that interaction and it will deepen their relationship. Whereas if the husband isn't aware of his hurt and then feels himself getting angry and then feels urges to criticize and then criticizes... And that's naturally going to lead to that reciprocal cycle where the wife is hurt, gets angry, distances, husband gets hurt, starts to criticize, and it just goes around and around and around. And so as a systemic therapist, as a marital couple's systemic therapist, I will focus on that recipro- at, at, on that mutual causality, on that circular causality, and I'll try to help them become aware of it and help them to have a, many different behaviors that are more constructive that are available to them. For many couples, when I present functional couple behavior to them, they will say, I've never even, I've never even considered that as an option. When, when I suggest to a couple, oftentimes I'll say, so when your feelings are hurt, how do you communicate that? They'll say, I don't know. I've, I've never communicated my feelings are hurt. I didn't even really, I wouldn't even call it that way. I feel like I only get angry. But most respectable, intelligent therapists know very well that people often feel hurt. Their feelings get hurt. And when their feelings get hurt, a much more acceptable feeling to have is anger. And this is true for men and women. In general, when men and women have their feelings hurt, they'll much more, they're much more likely to resort to anger behaviors, whether passive aggressive or just outright right, aggressive, than to express that hurt. 
because we've been socialized to do that way, we've learned it from our parents. We've learned that to be vulnerable is to be weak and therefore avoided. And so uh, we have all these reasons why we do that. But anyway, so a lot of what my therapy with couples involves that. And that can be quite complicated. It can be quite complicated. And there's a lot of barriers to that. Clients aren't easily convinced. Hurts run deep. Resentments run deep. People sometimes are so triggered in session that they can't really do anything of any construction. And so uh, it's really quite complicated. Another thing I do more specifically is I try to help couples to re- make requests of each other in a functional way. It's, I find it very frequent that people and couples have a hard time making requests of each other about things that are tense. You know, like, hey, that thing you said earlier hurt my feelings. Could you please apologize? A lot of couples that I talk to, they have urges for that sort of functional question and functional request. But those kinds of requests trigger both people to such a degree based on their previous issues that neither one of them navigate the waters effectively. And it explodes in a fight. And then the couples learn it's better to just not make any requests because I can't trust my partner to listen to me and to hear me and to respect me. And so I'll just stop. I'll just stop asking for things is what I find. But when couples ask for things in a vulnerable way and in a functional way, and the other person receiving the request responds in a functional way. Now, the person receiving the request doesn't have to comply, but there's a way of responding to a request that is respectful and loving and caring. You know, like, for instance, hey, you said something earlier that hurt my feelings. Could, could you please apologize? It's not that big of a deal, but you know, a little apology would be nice. I know you didn't mean it, but it kind of hurt my feelings. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I, uh, you know, thanks for, thanks for saying that. I, I, I won't, I'll try not to do that again. That took, how long? That took 15, 10 seconds? That is a magical constructive moment between a couple. How many couples talk like that? Now, I'm not saying they have to say that those exact words or even necessarily be that sappy, but that kind of communication is necessary in a close relationship, in an attached, bonded relationship. So often, what I see is the person making the their request won't say it that way. They'll say something like, you're so critical, or you're such a bitch, or something. You know, they'll, they'll, you know, you always do that to me. But even if the person making the request says it in a functional way, the person will receive it as a criticism and will attack it and defend themselves. Why, do you, why, do your, why were your feelings hurt? Why would you do that to yourself? I don't know what you're talking about. Your feelings are hurt. Why do I need to apologize for something that I, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings? Why are you saying this? You know, let it go. Let, lighten up. And there's just so much hurt and pain and, and difficulty and tension and, and, and frankly, just an inability to conjure a, an option that is functional. You know, when I, when I again, when, as I say, when I, when I suggest different ways of communicating, a lot of couples will say, I've, I've never even heard of that way of communicating before. And so there's a lot of talk about how to communicate and how to, how to know what you want to say. It's not just how to communicate, but it's, it's even knowing what you actually want to communicate, what your real intention is when you're saying things that you're saying. When someone says you're a bitch, they're not really saying you're a bitch. There's something that led up to that point where they needed to insult you. You know, before that, that you're such a bitch is probably down the line, the original experience by the person was probably one of pain and hurt and disappointment. And if that's communicated, then that leads to much more functional communication be- between people. But a lot of people don't even know that because they something happens and then they just have this urge to call the person the bitch, but they don't know what led up to that. And so a lot of therapy involves that. Another thing uh, that I'll just say that, com- that comes to my mind is a lot of people, a lot of therapists, when a couple is, is in therapy and an individual issue comes up, like say the husband starts talking about his narcissistic mother and the pain he went through as a child. Well, a lot of therapists, a lot of clinicians will say, well, that's an individual issue. That's not a couple's issue. And that individual, that husband needs to be referred to an individual therapist. And what I say is absolutely if that's what the client wants to do. If the client wants to go to an individual therapist and talk about it outside of the couple's therapy, then absolutely, 100%, I'm behind that. 
But imagine this. Imagine the husband, and this is what I do with a lot of couples, after I provide them with the opportunity. I can refer you to another therapist to talk about this, but we can also talk about that here. A lot of couples I talk to will prefer to talk about it in the couple session. So just using that example, let's say you have a guy and it comes out in the couples therapy, you know, say session 20 or something, that he has this, this pain and this suffering as a child that is affecting his marriage because his, his mom was, was narcissistic. And so I might turn to him and say, well, tell me more that, about that. And you know, so he'll say, well, my mom was neglectful. I felt alone. I felt like everything was about her. I couldn't turn to my dad because he was really distant and, and uninvolved. And I was the one listening to my mom rant and rave. I was the one that had to be very aware of how my mom felt all the time. Otherwise, the whole family would fall apart. I had to grow up very fast. My mom treated me like I was a friend, like I was a husband or something. And I basically had to forego my childhood while my siblings got to have childhoods because they didn't have to deal with my mom the way that I was chosen to deal with my mom. And so, you know, we could go on and on about that. And we could start working through those feelings. And the husband could, you know, maybe have some emotion. And we might talk about this for a long time. And we might start making connections between that relationship trauma and the way he reacts to his current wife. All the while, while we're doing this, it's just a conversation between me and the husband. The wife is listening to this. And universally, 100% of the time, what happens is the wife says at the end of it all, says, I had no idea. I had no idea that my husband was suffering in this way. It explains so much. And I have so much more compassion for him and so much more patience for some of the issues that he has. I thought it was just because he was a jerk. But I can see now where that issue comes from. I understand him better. And I will now have more compassion, more patience, and more leeway. And when he starts to react, I, I, I'll say, oh, that might have something. I, I might have touched upon his issues with his mom, and I'll, I'll back off, and we'll talk about it in, in our next session or something. I mean, the magic that happens when couples work on issues of the individual nature during the couple session it, is really wonderful. Now, sometimes you might want to refer to individual therapy, but but um, I, I say couples should be at least given the opportunity to do that work with their spouse in the room. Now, some people say, oh, well, isn't that like targeting one partner over the other? And, and certainly some couples can feel that way. But after session five to 10, most couples are okay with focusing on one person in one session. Now, we wouldn't focus on that one person for 10 weeks in all likelihood. We might if, if that's what they really want to do. But usually it's just it's, it's visiting these individual issues on and off as we go and switching back and forth between the two people. So that's another thing that I do. I don't know if Dr. David Snarch does that, but, um, but that's what I do. All right. Well, please become a patron of the podcast if I haven't already, let's read some of the new patrons to the podcast. We've got Patron Danny, Patron Britton, Patron Cooper. we got Audra and Kim and Hannah and Shannon and Mark and Ryan and Jean-Paul. I love that name, Jean-Paul. we got Patron Egina, who pledged $100 per month. Patron Egina is freaking awesome. Love you. Patron Natalie, Melanie, and Peter, and Lily, and Joseph, and Elvin, and David, and Brian, and Laura, and all the rest of you. Thank you so much. When I started on this journey, as I've said before, I thought, no one's going to want to do this because secretly everyone hates me. <laughs> no one likes this podcast. And so it's really great to have people become patrons. We have 54, and we love all of you. And we want more. We want to get this thing to, I don't know, say two or 300 patrons, maybe more. But that's, that's sort of the number that we're shooting for. And so if you haven't already, please become a patron of the podcast. And let's take this to the next level, people. All right. Thank you so much for listening. This was the Psychology in Seattle podcast. That's the end of this episode. And please take care of yourself because you deserve it so much. Yeah.